Okay. Everyone, glad that you could join us for this fireside chat between Jeff Apeson and Ryan Sringerline of Ryder. Our topic of discussion will be dealing with changing e-commerce industry dynamics, and I'd like to let Jeff and Ryan formally introduce themselves to the audience. So, Jeff, if you can start first. Sure. Uh, my name is Jeff Abson, Vice President of uh, Business Development for our e-commerce Rider Last Mile uh, Tech and Health and uh, Retail Consumer Brands verticals inside of uh, Supply Chain Solutions at, at Rider. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, Ryan, yourself? Yeah, thanks, Panzo. So Ryan Singerline, uh, Senior Director of E-Commerce Operations. Uh, I lead Rider's uh, e-com fulfillment product from an operational perspective. All right, thank you both for that. And uh, I've got a few questions here listed out, which will really focus on this kind of e-commerce growth topic for us. Um, and just to get you both started, uh, the first question I'd like to ask you is, how much of an impact has the pandemic had in further accelerating e-commerce growth over the past few months? And do you see this growth accelerating at the same pace long term, or is it a short term thing? Ryan, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I think recently I read that uh, we've had, uh, you know, e-commerce sales have accelerated about about four to five years. So I think that that trajectory uh, continue, but I do think we've made monumental ground, uh, you know, over the last six to eight months. Um, so I think some some of that will stay. You know, there, there's comfort in new categories that that I think will stick. Uh, grocery being a, a significant. Uh, uh, you know, area that that saw a, a significant amount of growth uh, over the last uh, six months, with with people being more comfortable purchasing those types of products online without being hands on. So I think uh, you know the trajectory that we've experienced. I think we'll maintain this growth, but I don't think we'll continue to grow in that fashion. Yeah, I think I think I I agree with Ryan. I think the is is sort of the expression that we're not we're not going to go backwards now. You know, um, lots of lots of different types of products and groups of people now have that that comfort level that it's it's okay to buy online and you know whether it were, you were you were an elderly person and you're you were felt compromised uh, by going into a retail store or a grocery store um, you know perhaps this was the the opportunity for you to get comfortable with e-commerce. Um, and, and buying online. So I think, you know, Ryan mentioned different categories, but I think even different different population groups are now finding that this is a, um, a much a much more attractive way to shop uh, in, unless you like going into stores. But I think uh, from a convenience standpoint, we're not going to go backwards. It's, it's, this will continue to uh, to to grow at the, the, the rates that we had seen historically. And on this subject of growth, uh, what are some of the surprising area areas you have seen growth in? Um, I think I think some of the the surprising areas are um, like Ryan had mentioned this just a moment ago, but some of the some of the products that are you would find in like a, a CPG type of vertical, so things that historically, you know, you would think about as being cash and carry in, in a in a store, a grocery store or or a convenience store, and now all of a sudden you can buy, you know, drinks or chips online. Um, I think I think food is an is a really interesting category where people are trying to come up with creative ways to do e-commerce fulfillment. I think some of the other areas are, and this is growth, but also growth that's you know specifically tied to. Uh, COVID, but things that really um, are geared towards comfort, and so um, you know, comfort in your home. So we saw we saw at one point that there's a significant spike in in bread machines um, and other home appliances. But when you start thinking about you know people who do have disposable income, if they've been fortunate enough to be able to retain their jobs and not be impacted by COVID. People are not taking vacations and you know spending more time in their homes. People are are spending um, more money on on their home um, in in and around their home. 
Yeah, yeah, just adding to that too. I think re- retailers have become, uh, you know, cognizant of the cost for shipping, you know, lar- larger products. And I think uh, historically there, there's been, uh, you, you know, it's it's fit a, a separate model because the cost is different. Where that that type of cost for something that large is is maybe passed on to the consumer. But we've seen a bit of a shift where where they've been able to to get those costs down. And make it more attractive because they didn't have that that retail outlet or brick and mortar outlet for uh, for consumers to go and touch the product. So they had to pivot and figure out a, for a way to make it more attractive to to purchase those online. Yeah, and 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 as we know, you know, there have been many many companies who have outgrown their current facilities or they lack the expertise to integrate e-commerce fulfillment into their. Tra- Traditionally, you know, re- traditional retail fulfillment centers. So at what point do you think should companies look towards an outside provider? Yeah, I can take that. I think that there's a lot of uh, you know different things to contemplate when you're making that decision. Um, I think some of the larger ones are. are there was a, a sprint to to, to set up uh, an e-commerce presence. So I think uh, from a from a speed standpoint. Um, you know who can help you set that up the quickest, uh, and and when you work with you know third-party companies like Rider, uh, you get you get some subject matter experts who have experience launching facilities, launching products, and websites, things of that nature that can help uh, help you get that speed that you're looking for. Um, and, and then I think also you know there's a, a cost and, and capability uh, concern going on right now where you know certain certain markets from a, a last mile standpoint are um, are stressed or, or overwhelmed, and you can push products into different markets if you have a, a partner that has presence in other areas. Um, and you know, you know, from a, a shipping standpoint, you know, we have a, a rider has a pretty significant uh, spend with, with the uh, car- different carriers and parcel providers, um, which again generates a, a healthy cost savings opportunity that, that our, uh, our customers can tap into. Yeah, I think it's. I think the a lot of the dialogue that we've had with potential uh, customers is really driven by their discomfort in what you mentioned. You know, with with growth uh, becoming what it is, <clears throat> you know, I think anytime they step out of that comfort zone, I think it's time to get on the phone with a with a three PL. And what I what I really like about our solution is. It, it allows it allows our customers to really focus on their core competency, whether it be you know product development or marketing or whatever the case might be, and allow us to 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 do the fulfillment component. So go focus on your core competency. We'll manage the fulfillment um, in such a way that creates a a um, a predictable economic. Uh, type of scenario for you. I mean, we the way that we price our business is is in a very transparent way um, because price predictability in this type of environment is critically important, so that you understand at a transaction level about whether or not you're you're profitable or not. It's also important to understand um, you know, what, within our solution of what we like about it is we are able to offer to customers a, a variable costing model. So that you're you're not making significant upfront capital investments. You're you're working through a process to become integrated with us, and, and once you do that, um, then you you pay on a on a transactional level, which which I believe to be very attractive in the market. And given a, this rise in of e-commerce and and essentially a decline of brick and mortar, what kinds of transfer Transformations have you seen specifically in the food and beverage supply chain? Well, I, I think I think historically, um, a, a lot of food and beverage folks who who were not selling through an e-channel were really their distribution centers had really been focused on on retail replenishment and you know doing pallet picking and case picking. Um, and and now that you're focused on an end consumer uh, and going into D to C, you're really focused on case pick. Um, I'm sorry, each pick, which which is a 
you know, it's a fundamentally different type of operation that many of them are not are not geared for. So either they're, you know, they're they're figuring out how to do that, and and, and certainly many of them have and 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 will. Um, but that's I think the, the the one of the more material challenges in the in the CPG universe is is around just the physical flow of product. Really, those buildings and, and operations weren't designed for that. And in terms of bargaining power, so you know this has shifted from you know the larger companies to parcel providers who have increased rates and placed limits on big and bulky packages. How can companies combat these changes? Yeah, I, I touched on it a, a bit earlier. I think we're seeing uh, companies get get more creative with with who they're who they're using as um, uh, shipping and, and final mile providers, right? Um, so so we see a, a shift to, to regional providers um, that have capacity in certain markets. Uh, it, we talked about our our network of uh, of fulfillment centers and and um, and and last mile facilities that are in different markets so we have the opportunity to uh, leverage markets where there's more capacity with those providers and push more volume through there um, uh, so I, I think there's there's a couple of different ways that help combat that uh, and I think the best way is, is with uh, you know where you're placing your network and what markets you're, you're having uh, product come out of Jeff, you want to add anything to that, or want to go to the next question? No, I think I think Brian's got it. I, you know, it's interesting watching the small package providers, right, are, are in a, you know, a unique spot, and, and we, we've all we've all seen the, you know, the the market and and you know how how they're responding to this, <clears throat> you know, trying to distribute their you know, limited capacity to, you know, to their, to their customers. And it's, it's a, it's a unique problem. Um, but I think, I think Ryan hit on the, the majority of the options or alternatives that companies are looking for in order to be able to support their, their, their customer base, especially, especially now as we compound the challenge um, that we have because of COVID combined with, you know, our traditional peak season. Yeah, and, and let's talk a little bit about peak season. You know, obviously with with holidays looming, um, what is peak season going to look like this year, and how are you as an e-commerce logistics provider preparing for the holiday rush? Yeah, I can talk about what we're doing. You know, in, in the the, the e-com facilities, so we've done a lot to to forecast uh, labor needs. Uh, we're we're working with our customers to make sure that we have adequate plans and, and communicating with uh, our parcel uh, carrier partners to ensure that we have the right capacity and those volumes planned and, and, and pickups so that everything's you know communicated and we have the capabilities to get it done. Um, we're also looking at you know we're we're launching some automation early November that's going to help us scale in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're reaching out to, to you know, robotics companies to see what we can do to uh, be, be less dependent on, uh, on labor when, when it's a, a real struggle to, uh, to attract labor right now. And then doing some creative things to, to be a desired employer in those markets where, you know, uh, all the advertising you can do is very helpful and, and having wages that are competitive is, is helpful, but you've really got to have a reputation of being an attractive uh, uh, attractive employer so that you know through word of mouth and and uh, uh, you know alternative uh, you know ways to attract labor that that we're capitalizing on it and, and get the right people in the, in the facilities yeah I think I think on the customer side we're really stressing that they they try to provide us with a forecast um, and uh, although although invariably their forecasts will be will be wrong, um, you know ho hopefully it will be um, it, at least at least directionally accurate and will give us a really good point of view of what we're trying to plan towards. Um, 
but I, you know, as, as we've talked about here and, and we do all the time is that, you know, what, what will peak look like? Will it, you know, will the, you know, different, different sales that are taking place actually this week with different, uh, um, online marketplaces will that really kick off peak and will that flatten the curve um, on on peak or will will it be you know traditional and you know I think I think people are gonna just need to plan better because I, I, I think because of the uncertainty and unknown there may be some packages that uh, you know, might be in jeopardy of, of meeting their destination before the holidays. So I think it's, um, it's just going to be, um, you know, one with, where you have to be flexible and creative, like, like Ryan said, and, and, you know, companies that, you know, are not of the, you know, don't have the operational expertise and, and background and, and resources, I think are going to struggle. Um, I think, I think we're fortunate in, in that regard that we're, uh, we're well prepared for it. Right, and as we approach wrap time for for the session, you know, we you mentioned flex flexibility. You mentioned the need for you know somewhat accurate forecasts and then and proper planning. I want to ask either of you, for Ryan or Jeff, are there any kind of final thoughts you want to say to the audience? Um, you know, again, as we do approach peak season, anything, any lasting thoughts that might come to mind um, that you might have not brought up uh, through the session that we might have not addressed yet. Yeah, I think from my perspective, I think we, we, we hit it well. I think, um, it, you know, people need to get, get creative. If, if, you're, if you're running into a supply chain problem, you have an issue, you reach out for help. I think, um, you know, we're, we're always looking for that next challenge. So, um, you know, I, I, that's, that, that's probably the, the last thing I'd say is if, if you don't think we have the pro, uh, a product or, or, you know, capacity or, or whatever, uh, reach out. You'd be surprised. We have quite a bit of, uh, a, a variation of products so go. yeah no I, I i agree i think um you know, by, by waiting too long um you know, you're gonna you you will dig yourselves uh a, a hole that will be very difficult to crawl out of and you know i i think um the unpredictability of of what could happen this peak uh you know in terms of the growth i think Question is just how big, and uh, find yourself um, falling down. I think, I think that the longer you wait, the more difficult it will be to to dig yourself out. Excellent. Thank, thank, thank you both for that. And I also want to just remind the audience, um, as you're viewing this session, do feel free and type your questions, your thoughts, or comments in the chat section of this session, so that Ryan or and or Jeff. Uh, can get to them accordingly and they will be sure to address as many as they can as your questions or comments do come in. Um, the Rider team, uh, they, you can also view their uh, virtual booth on the event platform as well as their presentation on e-commerce pandemic sales uh, in the heavy goods segment of the agenda, uh, which will run at 2.20 p.m. Eastern time. I want to thank you gentlemen for, for a great conversation. I'm sure the audience will take a lot from this and hopefully they do contact you and reach out. Um, but but yeah, good stuff and, and look forward to the, the rest of the show and hope you enjoy it. Yeah, thank thank you and uh, be be safe. Yeah, thanks, Hazel.